Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this new uh, RSK webinar. Um, welcome here. And uh, I'm very pleased today to um, discuss and have a very interesting chat with Hector Hernandez, whom I will introduce more in detail soon. Just let me give you a couple of words about myself. So I'm Eddie Travia. I'm the regional director of uh, IOV Labs uh, in Singapore and in Asia. And um, IOV Labs is a mother company for R RSK and the, uh, was uh, created the RSK smart contract uh, network. And today we're going to see a use case in a very interesting industry, which is logistics. Um, and that's why we have with us Hector Hernandez, who is a CSO and co-founder of Dex Freight. So Hector is originally from Colombia. Um, started medicine originally, but then moved to this industry about two decades ago. Um, he's, he has been owning a, a freight brokerage firm, he's on the board of that firm. And for the last five years, he has been very interested in blockchain and discovered uh, how blockchain can help his own industry. And that's what we're going to find out today. Hi, Hector. How are you? Good, Eddie. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here. So before we're going to start the, the presentation, I would like you to tell us a bit more about the origin and how did you come up uh, with this idea and when did you decide to create um, Dex Freight? Thank you. That's a very good question. So over the last two decades that like you mentioned, I've been in the logistics space. Uh, I founded my first freight brokerage firm in the U.S. In, back in 2000. And as a small business owner, um, and also kind of a geek of heart, always trying to use technology to keep afloat and to be competitive, right? Um, so the very early, I, I was actually coding websites when nobody was doing websites back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. But I founded over the last two decades uh, several companies, and during that process, uh, looking at different technologies, I ran into first into Bitcoin, um, and I also occupied many roles. Uh, in the industry, right? From dispatch operations, sales, marketing, all the way up to CEO. But um, when I was doing dispatch, I was facing a big problem, which is most of the time that you find a truck for your customer, you're dealing with a new company because the market is so fragmented. And when you do that, uh, the people that you're interacting with, you don't know them, they don't know you, and you cannot trust each other because there's no reputation system in the industry. Um, so I got familiar with Bitcoin like five years ago, and from Bitcoin, I went through the rabbit hole, learned a little bit about smart contracts, and that's when it hit me. Right now we have a tool where we can get two people that don't know each other to figure out and negotiate terms and conditions, put it in a way that is not changeable uh, by any of, the, any of the parties, and then it will self-execute from there. Um, so that solved a big problem for us, and that's how the idea got, got born. Great, great, Hector. Oh, I forgot to mention that you are with us on this webinar um, out of uh, Miami, right? In Florida. Yes. Yes. Okay. In Florida. So, Correct. Yes. So it's uh, evening time for you. Thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Um, so let, if you if you are fine, let's start with the presentation. And uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit the, the format. So Hector is going to present uh, uh, Dex Freight, the solution how RSK is being used uh, in this, in this uh, solution uh, for transportation. And I'm going to maybe interrupt him sometimes with a few questions. But if you have any questions, keep them. And we can do a, a, a quick uh, Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So stay, stay with us uh, until then, please. Uh, Hector, I, I leave you the, the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you can go to the first one, Francisco. Um, so, I, there you go. Um, I don't know uh, how familiar are you in the audience with some concepts I want to touch on very quickly here. So, if you are into blockchain, you read at some point that supply chain and logistics both are um, use cases that are way described to be ideal use cases for blockchain. So, I want to make a, a, a distinction here what supply chain is and logistics is. And I like this quote very much where that it says a supply chain, you can think about it as a football coach where logistics is the quarterback. So, in supply chain, 
you have all the aspects of, of the product from the product cycle from the origin uh, till the end of the life cycle of that product. So from farm to fork, for instance, where logistics is more focused on making sure that those products move uh, from the manufacturer to the consumer, for example. Um, next. So uh, when we talk about logistics, a lot of people know, don't realize how big this industry is. And I want to touch a little bit on that. So right now it's about $8.2 trillion in the global market size. Um, in the U.S. it's $1.4 trillion. Um, if there is a projection that by 2023 it's going to be $15.5 trillion. Um, we are focused specifically on trucking, which is a subset. So when you talk logistics, you're talking about ocean freight, over the road freight, and also air, air cargo. We are focusing deck freight at the beginning in trucking, and we'll get into that in a minute. And then in the US, that trucking market is $726 billion. And the uh, for higher truck load market, which is, you see a lot of trucks in the road, so, so they are it's divided in two, the private fleets, trucks that are owned by, uh, let's say, Walmart, for example, uh, that actually you cannot hire. They are just used for that operation. And the trucking companies that are out, out there that you can contact and hire when you need to move uh, a shipment for, for you or for your company. Next. So to give more context on this, um, by GDP, if logistics was a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world, right? Um, so it, it touches everybody, and, and especially in trucking. Like if you look around you, everything that you see around you right now probably got to you by a truck. Um, people take for granted that, but there's a lot of effort that goes into it, and it's also a very antiquated uh, industry. Uh, so if you take in consideration that the projection is to be $15 trillion by 2023, uh, basically it's going to be the second largest uh, very soon. Next. So how is this, and this is just to highlight a little bit because I mentioned air and ocean cargo, and some of the, the, the premises that we're going to be discussing today apply to all of them, but we're focusing on the trucking market, not only because it's the largest industry, or the largest segment uh, within the um, logistics industry, but also uh, because it's one of the most fragmented ones. Um, uh, air, air shipping or ocean shipping is way more consolidated. Uh, so you lack a lot of the issues that you have in trucking. That's why we're focusing on this. And by the way, this, this segmentation is for the U.S., but if you look at other markets, like the Asian market or the North American market, you're going to have similar numbers. Uh, next. Okay, so talking a little bit about the U.S. In the U.S., you have, and this, is, this starts to highlight a little bit of a problem, right? So in the U.S., you have about 250,000 manufacturers and millions of shippers because shippers don't necessarily manufacture the product. They could be importing a product or distributing a product. And it accounts for about $2 trillion uh, worth of goods that get moved every year. Now, those move, those uh, goods are moved by trucking companies. And in the U.S., uh, the, the, the Class A trucks, this is the 18 wheelers, we took about over uh, half a million, dollar, half a million uh, trucking companies, 500,000 trucking companies. Uh, but these trucking companies, for a particular shipper to interact with them, usually they rely on an intermediary, who, who are the freight brokers, because they bring consultancy, they, they bring some know-how, but they also bring the trust. So you don't have to trust a lot of trucking companies. You can trust just one intermediary that you know. Um, and then that intermediary is the one that will source that capacity. When I say capacity, I'm referring to the trucks. And those trucks move using 3.5 million truck drivers uh, to deliver those goods to the 300 plus million customers in the US. Next. Okay, so that takes us to, to the big problems, right? And there's a lot of problems in logistics. Some of them are, cause for some of them are these two in the screen. So fragmentation. Um, when you say fragmentation, just to give you a sense of how fragmented this industry is, in the U.S., 90% of the trucking companies have six trucks or less. If you take the 10, the 10 largest carriers in the U.S. with thousand, uh, thousands of trucks each, they don't account for 5% of the market. And 97% of the trucking companies are 20 trucks or less. 
So it's highly fragmented. And the other way to think about this is that these are uh, usually working with a broker, which a broker itself could be kind of a network or a marketplace where they have shipments and they have trucks, right? Um, but they, uh, the, the market is pl plagued by many of these brokers, 16,000 of them. So each one is a network that don't connect with another network. So whether they are in a digital platform or they are um, just talking on the phone, which a lot of them still do, uh, they, they don't see each other. So that's one of the big problems that, we've, that, that Dextrate is solving for. And that as, as you see the presentation, uh, we progress here, you, you're gonna realize that very few companies uh, are trying to solve this issue. And then the other issue is the lack of liquidity. So what I mean by this, because there's some blockchain people here and probably some marketplace people here, this is liquidity in a sense, not of supply and demand, it's liquidity in, in cash flow. So a trucking company picks up a load today, they deliver three days from now, and he's gonna pay, get paid on average 37 days later. And this is a big problem because he needs to pay for fuel, they need to pay for food, uh, they need to uh, pay, you know, cover all the expenses while in, in transit. And this is not fair, not fair at all. Um, so the alternative that they have today is, is called factoring, and that is a very high cost of capital. You'll be surprised, the larger the company is that, that's shipping the goods, the slower they pay. And this also turns out to be uh, not only for the U.S. market. Latin America is very, very famous for uh, high cost of capital, you know, with factoring, and also with large shippers or manufacturers paying slow. Uh, so we'll talk into, into how we're going to solve this later on. Um, so talking more about the fragmentation, if you go to the next uh, slide, Francisco, please. Um, one of the things that when you mention about different different networks uh, that are siloed, um, this, this is kind of a, re a good representation. A good way to think about it is if you have Uber in your cell phone, uh, but then you don't have ED, for instance, and you have a car uh, that is waiting on the ED network, you'll never see that car. Right, even if the car is sitting outside of your door. So this happened with the trucking companies also at a massive scale. When a truck is moving to pick up the goods, he often drives uh, two, 300 miles to find the next load. And that as a result, even though he's passing many loads on the way, because he don't see that, he cannot see them, it's very difficult to match that capacity with other loads that perhaps are better positioned with a trucking company. And, and the problem with this is um, not, not, not only that they uh, might be holding the shipment that doesn't give them the most uh, profit uh, in the case of the trucking company, but um, the other problem is that these trucking companies, when, um, uh, give, me, give me one second, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. the, the yeah. trucking company, these uh, these trucking companies, when you see them on the road, a lot of the time they are empty. So the estimation is that about three hundred million dollars of every every day are wasted uh, because these trucks are moving around. Um, so go to the next one, please. So uh, if we fix this and we just capture of this huge amount of wasted capacity or wasted truck, uh, empty trucks that are running around. If we just ca capture 1% of that, we'll save about 400 millions of fuel. Um, hello? Yeah, still you're yeah. still here, Hector, no problem. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting some weird thing that says that the connection is being refreshed, but anyway. Um, no, yeah, no, so we, we will save 400 million gallons of fuel. We also will save about 100 million hours, just with 1%, keep this in mind. And a 3 billion miles of uh, that will not be driven uh, per year. So if you think about that for a second, if you're on a road and uh, three out of four trucks that you see in the truck in, in the um, in the road are probably empty, imagine the stress that that puts in the infrastructure, in traffic, in pollution, right? So if you capture half of that, um, it will cause uh, it will cut emissions down by 100 million tons per year. By the way, trucks are one of the most pollutants when it comes to carbon emissions. I will save about $30 billion a year. And this is just in the U.S. market. So this is a problem that, that we are uh, really passionate about. And, and um, that, you know, we are thankful to have the support of the community uh, on the trucking side 
And that's why we have some of the traction that we have today. Uh, next. So the companies that I identified, um, uh, some of the companies are talking about this, and you've seen for many, many years, there was no investment at all in transportation. Uh, you still have today companies booking shipments using fax, email, uh, no platforms at all. So about five years ago, uh, with the arrival of Uber, of course, you know, if we move passengers, why don't we use, we also move cargo. And platforms uh, has been a business model, very successful business model in the last couple of decades with some of the largest companies in the world today, Google, Amazon being platforms. So of course they've been uh, entering this space. But the problem with this approach, um, um, and I'll highlight it in the next slide, if we can go to the next one, uh, Francisco. The problem with this approach is that since data is one of the most valuable assets today, these companies keep that data, data to themselves. So mm -hmm. the user that comes to an Uber platform to move a truck or any other platform usually only resides in that network. So it still have a silo, right? Even though it's digital, it's a digital silo still, right? So, and the data is captured by these companies. The companies become very, very valuable but the, comp the, the, the user itself doesn't get any value out of the data other than being hired and moving a shipment. And we think this is, the, this is the, the wrong approach. This is the Web 2 approach. And on the Web 3 approach, and you can go to the next one, what we're looking at is a blockchain technology integrating silos or breaking those silos to allow for a free exchange of data between companies or between networks, regardless if they are digital or not, to allow for optimization. So if you think about it, you use something like machine learning to figure out where all the trucks are and where all the shipments are, and you could, in theory, um, get a more efficient matching uh, based on certain criteria. But if they are all isolated, it's not possible to apply machine learning to this because they don't see each other. So that's what we're doing. We're bringing Web3, which is a paradigm shift that combines several things. The first one is, the ability for the users to exchange live market information without feeling threatened because they preserve privacy and they preserve the owner ownership of that data. So they are not giving away any trade secrets to the competition. Um, they are actually exchanging data, but, but keeping it to themselves, right? And if you go to the next one, please. So by doing this, we allow collaboration, right? If as a freight broker, I can tell you, uh, in countless occasions, we have shipments that we cannot find a truck for. And we go uh, using traditional methods to the ones that we know to see if we can find a truck over there, right? In this scenario, when everybody can see each other, they don't need to change the network they are residing on, right? By joining this network of network networks, if you will, uh, they are able to exchange that data. And this is how we enable collaboration, which we think sits at the center of breaking the silos and solving the fragmentation problem. Go to the next one, Francisco, please. So in the Web2 paradigm, what I was talking about, you know, and Google is very famous for this phrase, the don't be evil, right? But we know what's what been happening over the years and the, the, the public, especially in the business to business space, is becoming more and more aware of this. Uh, you build something on Facebook and or you publish a video on YouTube and then YouTube changes the algorithm and you have a platform risk there. You might build a business and they change the rule of the game. You don't know, you have nothing to say there and you just lose the business you just created. In the Web3, this, which is the new part of them we're building on, uh, we cannot change the rule of the game. Go to the next one. We can't be evil because we use... Um, blockchain to for these communities to get together, uh, set up the rules of that game or the, the rules of engagement with the peace of mind that they won't be changed by a CEO or a board directors of a company. And, and therefore, they can freely collaborate and, you know, being sure that no, the data is not going to get abused. They, go, they can enter the network anytime. They can lead the network. But the most interesting thing about this is that they are capturing value also. So if you're if you're part of a of a, a good way to think about it is, is 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 similar to a cooperative style, right? It's an open network that you're free to join or free to leave at any time. 
while you are there, you can leverage the tools to create value. And if you create value for yourself or the community, you get to keep some of the value. And in a DAO, you can also um, the, participate in the, in the way the decisions are made. Um, so everybody that participates in the network is not, is not only creating value, gaining value, but protecting their interests over time. Go to the next one, please. Uh, yes. Next or, yes. Um, well, I'll let you, I'll let you um, say it because this is an important slide for you, and then I will interject a little bit. So sure. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. So enter the X-ray. This is what we do. Uh, and this is a kind of a long phrase, uh, but it's, we're, we're, it combines our purpose and what we do. So we're simplifying logistics for a better world, and we do so with a decentralized fintech-enabled market network for freight companies to handle shipments from booking to payment in one place. So we mentioned before uh, the difficulties of interacting that I had to face when I was a dispatcher myself uh, with trucking companies, spending three hours on every single shipment using phone, email, faxes, right? Uh, Dex rate as a tool, when you see it, um, you're basically lowering the friction there and reducing the time from booking a shipment from three hours to, to minutes because everything is in one place. You have all the tools at your disposal. A typical dispatcher today, they have five screens, three phones, you know, it, it, it's very hectic there. The FinTech enabled part is very important here because in most of these networks, they find each other with digital means or by phone, but at the end of the day, there's no settlement. Everything happens outside of the network uh, via wire transfer and paper checks. And market network here is another uh, buzzword that is used. It's basically a marketplace, but where since all the tools are exposed via APIs and oracles, anybody can find different things to build on top of this thing, build value for the network. Uh, so this is very important. And the purpose, we really want to leave behind a better world. And that's one of the ways we... Um, interface so much uh, with RSK because we share a lot of the values of RSK. Um, you had a question, so. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily a question, but just um, I think I want to highlight that you're taking on a, a huge task and, and in, I, I want to make sure that the audience realizes this as well because, you know, you're, you're trying to disrupt, of course, for the better, uh, an industry which is uh, at the core of the economies of, of many, or, you know, of, of most of the nations, and it's an incre I mean, it's a, as you explained, it's it's at a scale that hasn't been done before. You know, you're talking about trillions of dollars uh, industry, and I think it's very interesting because today we have a lot of um, applications that are trying to do the same, but in much more niche and smaller markets, and usually markets where the data is already available and, and electronic, right? And you, you're breaking into an industry where uh, you have physical goods, as you were saying, you have faxes, you have papers, you have phones, uh, phone calls, etc. So I think uh, you, you're really uh, going for a challenge here. And I wanted to, to highlight this and make sure people realize uh, the, the, the size of the task, if, if you will. Um, and and it, it demonstrates that you know you need very solid solutions for that. And I'm eager now to learn more about how you know RSK is is actually part of that solution. Yeah, we'll, we'll highlight that in, in a minute. Um, yeah, you you're right. And and if you look at the team that we put together to this, um, so our CEO Jim Handouch is a former president of Lanstra Logistics, it's a multi-billion-dollar company, the largest freight broker. And one of the largest logistics companies in the U.S. Uh, you, we have Ricardo uh, Escobar in the team, who's also the former CIO of BHP Billington, the largest mining company in the world. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, it's, a, it's a formidable task, but it's also a task that anybody that's in the space understands. And we're not necessarily stepping in somebody's toes. Even, even if you look from the context of Amazon or Uber or any of those companies, this is something that is done right. If, it, if it's done right, it will benefit them too, right? Because they can exchange shipments and have live market information exchange across networks. Um, so yeah, we going back to the solution here, and I'll get into the RSK in a minute. So mm -hmm. the decentralized infrastructure for logistics, right? How do we solve the fragmentation? I'll touch a little bit on this. So integrating the data silos, safe and secure 
live uh, market data exchange, uh, cross-company workflow automation. This is huge, right? Because when it's not only about negotiating the terms of the deal, putting them together uh, in the industry uses something called rate confirmation sheet. It's basically a piece of paper. So let me walk you through that process. You know, I, I, I'm looking for that clocking company. I found it in, in what is called a load board, which is very similar to a Craigslist. You go there, you see trucks that are available in that area. You call them on the phone. After negotiating with several of them on the phone, you arrive to a price. And when you negotiate everything, then you get all the documents, right? To figure out if they are a valid company or not. After three hours, you end up with a piece of paper that believe it or not, you either send by fax or they scan it and take a picture and sign it. Mm -hmm. So that piece of paper, the average transaction is about $1,200. If something goes wrong, remember 50% of the time is a company that you don't know anything about. If something goes wrong, you cannot get, take somebody to court for those you know, twelve hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so smart contracts sits at the center of the solution, because mm -hmm. instead of being just a regular rate confirmation sheet, all of these terms and conditions go into the smart contract, and this is where RSK comes along. Um, mm -hmm. So, we we figure out since the very beginning that we didn't want to build a blockchain ourselves. Bitcoin is around; it's the largest blockchain, um, and what was missing on the Bitcoin network was the cap the capability of running smart contracts. Uh, so, and we were looking at Ethereum to be totally honest at the very beginning, uh, but then we had the crypto kitties crisis where uh, the throughput got really compromised. And we're like, if, if, if our transactions, imagine in Truckload, you have a billion dollars a day at a thousand dollars each transaction. So you're talking about a huge volume that needs to be processed. And if we have crypto kitties in the middle of it, it's a huge crisis. So fortunately, you know, fortunately for us, uh, we participated in one of the La Big Comps. I think it was in Bogota in 2000, at the end of 2017. And at that time, uh, actually, RSK was going now into mainnet from testnet. And it happened right after CryptoKitties. So it couldn't be better because now we had the possibility of using smart contracts on top of the Bitcoin network, right? So what else can we ask for, right? We have the largest network, which is the Bitcoin network, the more secure network by hashing power. And, and now we have smart contracts on top of it. And they started in Latin America. We, we have a, a big strong food, uh, a big food in, in Latin America. So, so that's how we got uh, initially uh, interested on using RSK. But going back to that cross-company workflow automation, once you have the smart contract, the whole thing from that point on gets automated. So if the carrier delivers on time, he will get the payment. If the agreement says that the payment will be released as soon as it delivers, he doesn't need to call anybody. He doesn't need to send an invoice. He doesn't need to um, to get accounts payable or accounts receivable involved, nothing. The smart contract triggers and the, the, flow, the, the funds or the value gets transferred from one end to the other. Nobody can stop it. And that's exactly uh, the level of efficiency that is required if we really want to change this industry. Now, since we have everything in the smart contract, this opens the door for the second solution that we talk about here. So remember when I was talking about uh, payments being very slow in this industry? Every transaction in debt rate is born digital, right? Without knowing, because a trucking company doesn't really, really need to understand blockchain at all. They just see a regular app. But without knowing, they are signing cryptographically every transaction. Therefore, that rate confirmation sheet that I was telling you have a, a digital brother, right? So we tokenize that using non-fungible tokens. Uh, it's a token that is, is it has all the parameters, is unique uh, to that transaction. And that digital asset, different than Bitcoin or Ethereum, that it has a fixed cost. It won't change over time. It's 1200, there's no fluctuation in price. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good collateral for the de decentralized finance ecosystem. For the ones that are not that familiar with DeFi, um, in the, in, there are some crypto networks and there is, there is a huge um, inflow of innovation in this space using smart contracts to bring cheaper liquidity, you know, faster loans, programmable loans, uh, yield. Um, but one of the things that... It, that, that um, industry, nascent industry was missing was high quality collaterals are digitally born. 
And that's what we bring to the table, a digital invoice that can use be, can be used right away as collateral in the decentralized finance ecosystem. So we have a joint venture with MakerDAO on this, and we also work in Money on Chain to happen, happen to be also on the RSK network. And uh, with that, we were able to source uh, loans at 0.4%, that's per month, um, compared to the 3% that the industry is paying. I'll go to the next one, please. And just, uh, Hector, this, this joins also something I'm very keen on, which is bringing um, DeFi, you know, liquidity and transparency, flexibility to the real economy. This is something I... Um, I wrote about recently called the coded income model and this and you what you're saying really you know uh fills that gap you know we you have an industry which is a based in the real economy and how can it benefit from all this liquidity and this uh you know frictionless systems fluid systems from the defi world so i really i really like that aspect uh, as well yeah and we have a lot of challenges ahead in regulation and in some other areas but the one thing that is very evident is you have markets like the U.S. where you have cheap liquidity. And if you have members of this network in the U.S., then you have other users in Latin America when it's very expensive. So you can have liquidity move around without borders. Mm -hmm. And that is that is a huge thing. Now, we get asked all the time, can this be done with a, with a regular database? This is a typical question. And I'm not going to go into every detail here, but the, the quick answer is no. So smart contracts... Yeah, you can have a centralized database, but if you have a centralized database, then it's not going to be immutable. Anybody can change it. Therefore, it removed. It has a lot of risk to the to the equation because it can be altered. Uh, the other thing that is missing in in the trucking industry uh, is reputation. Um, a good way to give you an example: if you if you're buying something from eBay, usually you don't you don't buy on eBay from people that had one star, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you really don't because you don't trust it. Now, index rate, you have the option, of course, to rate the satisfaction of a transaction in a very subjective way. But since the smart contract is connected via oracles to the real world uh, shipment, right? And the whole shipment life cycle is moving along and it's being tracked. Then what we do is the trucking company, the shipping company, the receiver of the goods, even the truck, is creating reputation and yeah. this is not this is coming from kpis it's actually on time arrival to pick up on time arrival to delivery we cannot change it nobody can change it we cannot fake stars here it's coming out of that and this is very very powerful because in if you are interacting with one new carrier every other time uh this really lowered the cost of that interaction because you know in advance this guy delivers 98 percent of the time on time they you know never got any goods stolen is somebody that you don't need to trust you're trusting the reputation that is immutable because of blockchain so these are some of the things that cannot be done uh without blockchain and i'm not gonna go into more detail because uh this is well described there's a lot of documentation um on it but i'm happy to answer questions about it at the end uh go to the next one francisco please so going back to the the user rsk so this is kind of a dummy down architecture um, diagram. In the middle, what you have is the core interaction. The core interaction is trucks and uh, shipments, right? Being matched and interacting with each other. At the top, what you have is, since this is open APIs and eventually uh, is gonna be uh, available for everybody to bring smart contracts to the network, then you can build whatever you think. Imagine that you have a solution for I don't know, carriers to have parking, for instance, or to sell something to those carriers. You, you can bring that in similar to an app store, uh, but in, in a decentralized manner. And, and that's also, that, that's already available. But at the bottom, and this is the important part, we mentioned this already, you have Bitcoin uh, and you have RSK. So Bitcoin give you safety for those transactions, peace of mind that you have the largest network, never being hacked, you know, battle tested. And for build for one purpose, which is security and, and, and preserving value. And then you have an escape, which is built with a scale in mind, right? Instead of having, you know, seven transactions uh, per minute, then you, you want to go up uh, so we can have uh, a, a real throughput that be usable. 
uh, go to the next one, uh, please, Francisco. So RSK is not only providing that sidechain. Um, before you do play, RSK is also providing the tools. That's okay. Let me show you an example. So here you have a document that needs to be stored. When in, a, in any trucking uh, transaction, you will find out that all these companies are exchanging bill of ladings, are exchanging proof of deliveries, um, and these documents need to reside somewhere. Now, if we provided a Google Cloud, and you can do play, we can go if, if it plays, uh, Francisco. But if you use something like Google Cloud or, or any other centralized storage solution, you still got to have control over those documents. So the privacy can be lost. While we're looking at here in the screen, oh, we have the next one up. Uh, well, that's OK. So here we are, we are, let me see. Give me one second. OK, this is the doc, yeah. Okay, so the trucking company, they are approving the documents. And, and in this particular example, they are adding the W9. So they prove that they have a tax ID in the US. But this is already being stored using the RSK network uh, and the interaction with Swarm. So it's stored, instead of being a centralized computer, it's stored in multiple computers that have a copy of this. And it cannot be accessible unless you are the owner. This is some of the functionality that RSK uh, is bringing to the table. So anybody that builds something on top knows that they don't need to build decentralized storage. They don't need to build smart contracts or a blockchain for that purpose. Another good example is the next one. Uh, so on this one, uh, we already found a trucking company that's going to do the shipment and the driver uh, is going to get assigned. So this is the truck, the trucking company, the tr dispatcher assigning a driver. And once he assigned that driver, now, this is something kind of magical because this doesn't exist in the industry. As the driver is moving around, you can set up the terms in the smart contract to get him paid per mile. Now, the trucking companies negotiate per mile. If you can see on the top right corner, you see risk tokens being moved. Uh, so we use payment channels, which is what the Lumino payment channels, um, to similar to what the lighting network for the ones that are familiar to that. Uh, so that trucking company, the truck driver in his cell phone is receiving those, that, that value right away. This is not a promise of value, right? This is not like you have loyalty points that then can disappear. You actually have control of these tokens and this can be used immediately uh, and anybody that can receive them. Um, so, and you see it here, you have the, the, the balance there, and you can use that balance right away to pay for some goods or services as you move around. So it's not only DeFi that so for for that problem of the of covering the cost and the cash flow. It's also the solution. Um, I want to stop there for a second to, to see if you have any questions so far in those two things because I think the audience might be interested in that. Yeah, I I, I think the 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 payment is very interesting first of all because it's striking visually you know uh and also because as you say this is nothing this has never been done before you know people it's kind of a we're used to pay-per-view uh here is more like a paper drive or paper mile <laughs> so it's quite yes. a, it's quite a, a, an interesting concept um i i just want to point out that um you know, RSK has many services, and I, I guess the one you were showing before is, is um, uh, Rift Storage. Rift is the RSK infrastructure framework, and and the Rift Storage works with Swarm, as as you were showing, and that's mm -hmm. part of the different services that are uh, uh, fall under RSK and the Rift services. Um, and also now you are talking, you you were showing an application with Rift tokens, but I'm sure. And maybe you talk about this later on in your presentation, but I'm sure you're also familiar with the uh, stable coin that Money on Chain has created with Reef, which is a Reef dollar on chain, which most probably is also very convenient for for this kind of of payment uh, payment channels. Uh, yeah. I think, and I think Andreas refers to this as um, Andreas Antonopoulos mentioned uh, a couple of years ago. Um, back uh, money streaming. So I think that's what we're talking about here. M money streaming, right? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's money streaming, but it's, but it's happening because it was uh, prearranged. I mean, programmed because the two parties agree that if you drive yeah. those two miles, you get that money. So it's literally money streaming. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, no, I think I think it's great, and I think we have a very good example of uh, using the tools in in a way that that makes sense for all the uh, all the participants. Uh, yeah, very very interesting. I let you go on with the explanation of the of the sure. infrastructure. You you mentioned you mentioned money on chain. I wanna I wanna say something real quick. Um, mm -hmm. It is important that these stable coins exist, uh, these stable assets exist, because if we could use Bitcoin to pay the driver, we could use other assets. But if if you hire a rookie company today and the price of Bitcoin is eleven thousand, by the time they yeah. deliver the price is twelve thousand, then somebody's losing, right? Uh, yeah. with, what is very interesting with the money on chain approach is that you could use um, these uh, tokens as collateral, but you can also denominate in any currency in any part of the world. So it could be RIF with dollar or RIF with peso in the local denomination. So if you're going to go, and this is this is being designed to be a world-class solution and to be used all over the place, you need a way to translate uh, that money streaming uh, to the local currency. Um, so yeah, th that that's a team that I know very well. A big shout out for them. They they doing amazing things, and we've been collaborating for over two years now. Um, so yeah. So continue with the presentation. What you see on the screen, I'm not gonna go into details here. This is very complex, but all, all I want is to show that at the top you have the broker that's sourcing capacity, looking for a truck, and at the bottom you have the carrier. And what I was mentioning, three hours, phone, email, faxes, all those arrows that go up and down. That's exactly how they get solved today, phone emails and faxes. But with Dexrec, Dexrec takes care of all of it. And it, it also automates the process from the beginning. And that's why I wanted to show this here, because from the exchange of documents, from the uh, setting up of the agreement, from checking reputation, all of it is here, including tracking, which is very important. We get asked all the time, um, yeah, but we have other companies that are working in blockchain and logistics. And usually we are compared with IBM and Tradelens and, and those companies. I, I, and I have big respect for those organizations. Uh, but, and, and, and the question is also, oh, you probably use it for tracking. Tracking has been around for many, many years. Tracking can be done with a centralized uh, database. Now, since we are here and it's immutable, of course we're going to do it with blockchain, but we wouldn't build something like this just for tracking. Uh, so this is also, it's not only different from the Uber freights, convoys, and decentralized companies of the world, but it's also very different with the ones that are talking blockchain in logistics. This is not only for document provenance or tracking, this is for business model innovation. Uh, go to the, to the next one, please. Okay. Talking about business model innovation, how do we make money on this thing, right? If you're talking about a DAO, which is the middle layer here, where everybody's gonna own a, a, a stake in this network, how do we make money, okay? So it's similar to a freemium model. A trucking company joins or a freight broker joins, we don't want any friction there. We don't wanna charge them for a transaction. Web3 is not about rent seeking on the transaction level, that's Web2 where you pay eBay for everything that you sell in eBay, or you pay Uber for every ride that you take in Uber. In Web3, um, this is what we like the freemium uh, similarity. The value gets created because you have the trucking companies there. So you don't want to charge the trucking companies. You want them to interact with the freight brokers and the shippers. Um, it, and, and that's one of the reasons we don't charge anything there. So once they are transacting, what we bring is a lot of new services to the table that are enabled by smart contracts too. So at the top, you have the shipper, carriers, and brokers who are the users. In the monetization layer, you have four profit modules, pro modules that provide a value service and it's optional for the user to consume. So the DeFi invoice financing that I mentioned before is one of them. And in that one, uh, I, I'm not gonna get into it because we touched a little bit of it, but it's basically if, if the carrier wants to, they can, finance the transaction, get paid right away instead of waiting for the 37 days later. Another one that's part of DeFi is insurance. And I want you to think about this for a second. If a trucking company is empty 30% of the time, they still have an umbrella policy. Right? They still are paying, for, even if, if it's a, re, a repair shop or the driver is sleeping, you still are paying for that umbrella policy. And the cost of that goes into the goods that we are all consuming. So we are all paying for that inefficiency. But in that rate, since you have a reputation system and you know the goods that are moving, you know the cost of those goods, you know the route that they are taking, 
as you know, all the rules of engagement, uh, we can bring on-demand per load insurance. Instead of having an umbrella policy, this is a, a smart policy that adjusts according to the value of the goods that are moving in the network. So mm -hmm. in DeFi, it's finance, but also insurance. Then there's also a logistic data marketplace, and this is a, a joint venture with Ocean Protocol, and it's one of the most brilliant teams out there when it comes to data, machine learning, sh uh, data sharing, and blockchain. And what it does is, we wrote about it two years ago in, in our by paper. We didn't know how to build it at the time, uh, and we didn't have to because these are the guys that also founded Big Chain DB. So they've been in the space for a long time. Trent McConaughey is, is, is we happen to to be lucky to interact with them. Uh, and this is a joint venture between the two companies. So if you're a trucking company, your data in the platform, you can monetize it. Like a small trucking company with a truck, the data is probably not that much valuable. But if you put it together with a lot of other data and aggregate it, they can get money. Of course, they actually make money in the process, um, but the trucking company makes money there. And then the premium services, this is very important. So now that you have the visibility and they see each other, machine learning, right? Now, if they see each other, the trucking company is driven by a guy that is, is only capable of fixing certain problems. But when you have so many, you know, you can choose the destination. Is it the, is it the best load, the one that's closest to me or the one that's going to certain markets? So we have some algorithms that, that do matching based on their criteria, but then they also plan the tour and, um, and the trip. So the trip meaning it will let them know what is the best route to take to get, make more money. And since these truck drivers are about three weeks of the month outside of their house, it can also tell them which markets to go because now you have pricing data. So now you know exactly where are the markets that are paying better. And this capacity can be moving around in a very proactive way. And for those, they, it's a SaaS model. So the trucking company sees the value, they get a trial, if they like it, they pay a subscription and voila, their dispatchers are, don't have to think hard to get the best load out there. And last but not least, the third-party dApps. I mentioned that before. If you have something, you can build it on top of us, similar to the Apple Store or the, or the Google Play Store. Go to the next one. Um, so we're getting close to the hour. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. This is a product. It's working today. Um, and, and But the, the product, uh, an important thing here to mention is a lot of the UI that got built is because we needed to prove this concept. But ideally, Dexfree will be a standalone, a, a middleware. Uh, if you, if a trucking company already uses a transportation management system uh, or the freight broker, we can connect via, via APIs to those systems. They don't really need to go to another website and log in and negotiate. They can consume all of these services from the TMS. So it, it is a middleware. But if the trucking company don't have the system, because a lot of them do, don't, they don't have that kind of money uh, to give the luxury to buy expensive tech, they can become digital right away without spending any money. And this is very key uh, because if you're talking about a fragmented industry with 97% of the trucking companies being 20 trucks or less, becoming digital is, 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 is very valuable for them. Uh, go to the next one. So we combine this web app with the mobile app. And the mobile app allows for several things. So the driver can add documents, take pictures of the proof of delivery, uh, the, that then are later hashed in the RSK network, but also sign um, cryptographically, that is, uh, for every step of the way uh, to make sure that the shipment gets delivered in the right way, change the status, uh, and, and receive payments. So the whole thing, they can do it from their hands. And this is designed in two flavors, one for the fleets that are very large, where they just assign an employee as a driver, or for the owner operator, that makes the decision they can book the shipment, negotiate the shipment from the mobile app um, and get it going. Now, the blockchain guys in the audience will be thinking, oh, but how do you interact from an app to the blockchain? It's centralized, it's a point of failure. In reality, we are combining the information from the app from with all the data sources. Every truck in the US by law have an electronic login device that is connected to the internet. And a lot of them, especially the larger fleets, also use GPS. So we connect the GPS, the ELD, the mobile app, and get information from the uh, shipper and the consignee also to make sure that when the smart contract triggers the payment is because the shipment was delivered and not before. Uh, go to the next. So this is a short video to show where are we in, in the life cycle of the company. 
So we are currently in beta. Uh, this highlights, you know, we've been this is highlighting uh, um, the network effects. We bring broker shares. They bring loads, which is the demand. Uh, by having loads, you get interest from the carriers that bring in. If you have more carriers, you attract more brokers, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you can pause here for a second. Uh, so what you're looking here uh, on the y-axis, you, you have a time. And on the y-axis, you have the, the number of shipments. The red background indicates the beta. And that's when we started at the beginning of the year. Uh, so the first dot is the first broker that we onboarded, which was G, uh, WTS. The second one is GLT. And as we progress, you're going to see more brokers getting added to the equation. On the right-hand side, you see the number of carriers that are already in the network that were used to move those shipments. Uh, the number of trucks, because when you do the math, we have access to the FMCSA data, so we know exactly how many trucks do that company have, and, and we can match it and estimate how many trucks do we have now in the network that are available. On the top left uh, corner, you have the number of shipments that got processed and the freight spend. Freight spend is a logistic term for trucking. It's basically how much money got transacted. Uh, so do play, uh, please, Francisco. So as we continue in this diagram, you will see uh, more brokers getting added to the equation. And at some point, the launch of two of the services. So basically, we launch uh, the DeFi services and the drainage, which is uh, focused on cargo that comes out of the port. So that's WTS, one broker. You can see it on the right-hand side, then GLT, the second broker. And now you can see how this grows exponentially. Uh, one of the things that we also did is add nodes to the network. And those nodes are transportation management software companies because brokers have a lot of shipments and shippers, but TMSs have a lot of brokers. So you really want to expedite this thing. Uh, so that's a third broker, ARS, another customer. The DeFi launch, we already tested, it's already working today. The Dryer is already tested. Can you pause for a second there? So the first one that you saw there, is, is technology, is the first uh, integration that we did uh, with this TMS. Now, from that point on, now you can see how, how it grows exponentially. And now the dots are not brokers anymore. From this point on, all the dots that you are seeing, let me see from this one, this is technology. From this point on, these are transportation management software. So the two, the first two is $800 million of shipments between their 500 customers. Um, so, so you get an idea, if you do play, it will play. If not, we can go to the next one. But you get an idea. The, the idea here is focusing on nodes that can bring a lot more value to the network right away. And this summarizes all. And this is probably a week old now. But in the platform today, we have 350 shippers, 593 brokers, 650 carriers, about 12,000 trucks. And of those carriers, 263 of them did at least one booking in the platform. We are adding uh, on average 24, uh, 25 companies every week. Uh, the total of shipments uh, is already over 800. This is a little bit outdated. Um, and that's about uh, $1.1 million of freight spent already transacted in the platform. So think about this for a second. This is important. In blockchain, the one thing that we get criticized for is, yeah, but where's the, where's the real world use case? Who's using it? Where's the transaction? This is where transactions are. Any of those customers can come and look at it and see and touch it by themselves, right? Uh, go to the next one, Francisco. We have three minutes, so I'm not gonna uh, go over here, but this is some of the partners that we are interacting with. And it's important to mention, and we'll go to the next one, Francisco, we'll mention in the other one, um, the so some of the achievements, right? So we got selected last year by 500 startups to do their growth program. We just completed that at the end of last year. Uh, we have been selected two years in a row by Freightways Magazines, which is uh, uh, the most influential uh, magazine in the U.S. for logistics, uh, as the uh, most disruptive and innovative freight company uh, in 2018 and 2020, and, and also by supply and demand uh, chain executives. And last but not least, we are part of the World Economic Forum um, uh, work group for supply, blockchain and supply chain, and we are highlighted in their in their uh, paper of sustainable blockchain for for supply chain. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know if we have anything else there to show for.
right on the hour, I guess. Yep. Thank you, Hector. Yes, great. I mean, I, I know there is a lot to cover, and I'm uh, very thankful for you to to go over it uh, as quickly as possible. I mean, it's a uh, it's not only a huge industry, but it's a uh, it's a um, it's a very long flow, and it involves a lot of actors that, uh, as you as you pointed out. So I'm also uh, thankful for the audience who has, uh, I would say, uh, ninety percent stayed as have stayed with us. So that's great. Um, I let me see if we have time for a few questions. Um, first of all, uh, Hector, can you stay with us a little bit longer? Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Of course. Um, I I don't know if I can see questions somewhere from the audience. Um, maybe Francisco can help me out with that. Uh, is yeah, there there's a an way? arrow on the top left corner. There's an arrow there. Ah, yes. So yes, yes. there's, yes, yeah, there's somebody yes, saying yes. here, shippers don't want to pay immediately. That is why the industry trend is moving towards 120 payment terms, large shippers, would DeFi then be paying per mile and assuming the risk of non-payment? That's a very good question. We have we do have somebody that likes logistics here. Yeah, so that you, this is totally right. Um, if you uh, because at the beginning people talk about uh, escrow using smart contract and escrow, and if you do that, it means that the shipper will have to put the money in the smart contract at the beginning, therefore affecting their cash flow. They don't want to do that. Uh, the reality here is that. If we can, when you said about assuming the risk, right? The risk profile of these transactions in the US when you have a broker that's a PE is very low. And, and the reason why is because by law in the US, every freight broker to get a license need to have a surety bond. And that means that all the transactions are have an insurance behind them. So not only we have a lot of deterrence in the platform because the, the, the reputation is immutable. So if you play dirty, the networks end up excluding you from, from this network, uh, your reputation. Uh, but on top of that, the risk that is assumed on the DeFi transaction is collateralized by that, um, by that uh, bond, surety bond. And one of the insurance products that we're working on is specifically an on-chain surety bond that will be the buyer of last resort of that invoice in case it goes delinquent. So the system, if the invoice uh, for some reason is not paid, they say, you know, the, the, the shipper uh, disconnect its bank account or it doesn't have a balance or something weird happens there, uh, the buyer of last resort, the smart contract as a bond will pay for that transaction immediately and it will liquidate the asset. But the issue here, if, if that happens, that freight broker immediately gets um, a bad mark into their license and it will have 30 days to basically the bond gets canceled and you will have 30 days to replace that bond uh, with the risk of losing their license forever right so this is why the risk profile is a lot better here so the answer is it's, it's a complicated question but the answer is yes uh, there is a risk is mitigated by many factors, mitigated some and some over transfer uh, to be able to keep the DeFi engine stable uh, so we can do the payment streaming or the payment at the end of the transaction. So would you integrate with payit.org? Okay, so we are all for collaboration. We don't talk the talk, we just really do it. That's why we have partnerships um, in the freight industry, but also in the blockchain industry with RSK, with Ocean Protocol, with Maker, with Money on Chain. Uh, I, I, I'm not that familiar with pay.org. I would be love, I would love to get an intro and look at it. And we will, we will. Anything that can bring value, anything that we don't have to invent that is already there, that is proven, uh, by all means, bring it on. Yeah, what thank else? you, thank you for the question. I think some of the questions have been asked earlier on uh, in the during the presentation. Uh, I don't know if we will have time to go through all of it, but I let you have a look, uh, Hector. If yeah. you think some are let me see. interesting to yeah, I think to some of them. Yeah, I think some of them we answer as we were going. So, what are the incentives for carriers, brokers, and shippers? So, the main incentive for them right now is being able to book the shipments. By the way. Uh, and reducing the time it takes for them to do it to minutes. 
in a very secure way using smart contracts. So reducing the trust uh, issue um, and streamlining the process and automating the process with the settlement layer between the different companies. That's the, the main incentive right now. Because we're looking at a, at a progressive decentralization approach, in the near future, when we talk about those nodes, we will have tokens that we cannot touch we cannot talk a lot about it now because we're in the US and there's some regulation here that we need to respect. But we're going to have incentives, the more important thing in crypto networks. Uh, we're very focused on that. And we're working with, again, the, one of the brilliant, the most, almost brilliant minds in the space to make sure that they are incentivized with and stake ownership of that network. So that, that I give you that as a preview. And then it says, are you essentially trying to build DAT? So that's interesting. DAT is um, is a load board that's been around for two decades, um, and it, it is basically a glorified Craigslist. Uh, the answer is no. We're not trying to build DAT, build a DAT. Uh, we can integrate with some of the of the load boards. As a matter of fact, we have a partnership that just got announced with Post Everywhere, and in Post Everywhere. Uh, we are getting shipments from Post Everywhere. We're posting shipments in Post Everywhere. We're happy to integrate with all of them. We are not about publicizing loads or equipment. We are about integrating multiple networks that I siloed today and providing a settlement layer for them to finalize the transaction using smart contracts. And then it says, how do you, okay, are you going to talk about fraud in the industry and how you expect to come back uh, known current fraud. There's some limitations to the technology, right? By having visibility and reputation, you minimize fraud. You have a lot of things here that by default improve, you know, documents are hashed. Uh, it's more difficult to, to fake them. Identities are blockchain-based identities. You can, it's a lot more difficult to uh, pretend to be someone, somebody you're not. Um, so, but there's some limitations to that, but there's some benefit. We already see them today in the transactions that are flowing. Um, so yes, uh, fraud is is a is a side effect, if you will. Um, our company provides procurement software, which your service allows to integrate price quotes and purchase orders. By all means, right away, you can do it today. As a matter of fact, those are the nodes that we were referring to. So if you have an ERP system, uh, or you have a, a, a procurement software, or you have an accounting software. Whatever you have, we have an open API we can integrate. And if there's something of value to our network, by all means, we can look into that for sure. Uh, what is there? Yeah. I think uh, this this I other question. I, I had a yeah, I had a question uh, um, separately. First of all, somebody has been asking me if uh, you started launching on the RSK testnet or directly on the mainnet. Uh, can you tell us a bit more if, if you know? That's a good question. We that. started, yeah, we started launching on the testnet originally, uh, mm. but we're now on the mainnet. The thing is, and we get this question often, uh, at the beginning, what we didn't want to do because there's some expenses associated to being on, on mainnet, and we mm. were testing this on beta, uh, we didn't really want to use, you know, smart BTC to pay for gas when, uh, when these transactions are still in beta with in a control environment. Uh, but yeah, we tested all of these things in mainnet and 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 run transactions in mainnet, but also not only in RSK on the DeFi ones that had to do with the maker ecosystem. We also test them in the in the mainnet on on Ethereum too. And. Um... Uh, how how can we verify the business rules um, that have been implemented in the smart contract? So I guess this is a more a question about the relation between the reality of the business on the ground and and the, yeah, the so interaction can, with the smart contract. I, I don't see that question. Can you can you read it again, please? Yes, yeah, sorry. It's how can we view or verify the business rules that have been implemented in the smart contracts? Okay, so. Transaction wise, smart contracts are, are used for different things here, right? Are used for the very basic transaction, the core interaction, which is the transaction between the carrier and the broker. And that transaction, the, the ones that can verify are the ones that are signatures of that transaction, which is the two parties. Um, so we use a combination of different uh, methods from proof of existence to, to now privacy preserving uh, use of, of smart contracts. Uh, so so in a not in a nutshell, if you are not part of a transaction, you cannot verify it. Now, on the DA, on the DAO, which is where everybody's going to belong to this thing, and this is a future thing, 
those are going to be open and it's going to be also eventually open source. Um, mm. So anybody can use it, can build on top of it, just like you will do with today with the, with the RSK or Ethereum. Yeah, that, that's something that I feel is, um, again, uh, another accomplishment here because you're bringing really the new, the, the latest business model around, basically the DAO, which is really advanced for for many businesses, especially for the old businesses or the legacy businesses like like this. So I think it's, it's really uh, a, a very in interesting at first experiment and then, and of course, a reality for you, a day to day reality. Yeah. Eddie, there's a question here that I would like to answer. It says, uh, yeah, sure. thanks for answering. Clearly thought out business logic and industry knowledge. How will Dex rate handle claims? This mm -hmm. is a difficult one. So by the ones that don't know what claims are, at the end of the delivery of a shipment, uh, it might be missing a box or a pallet or some of the goods mm -hmm. might be damaged or it arrives at the wrong temperature and a, great, a claim comes out of it. Um, so we, are, we have a couple, it's a multi-step approach. So we're, we're working on claim preventions. So there's a whole framework that we uh, actually, uh, really, we started to collaborate with Materio on this, which is making sure that whatever resides in the blockchain, it also matches the real world when it comes to legal law, even with the law. Uh, so that's free, uh, right? Then when it happens already, uh, there is a dispute resolution. In the meantime, it's still very, very much centralized, but we're also working uh, with different solutions. So we have, um, you know, the Aragon core that we look into uh, where judges can be uh, so solving. So the, the very first approach is if there's a claim, the two parties can argue. And if they are reaching an agreement, they, they can, you know, sign or modify the terms of the, of the smart contract and it finishes. The second one, if they do have a dispute, there is either Claro's court or, this, or the Aragon court. In the meantime, we mediate. Uh, but uh, the idea uh, down the road is for these parties, because in the U.S. you need to be, in order for you to be a judge in those type of scenarios to mediate, um, you need to have a license for it. But with crypto incentive, you can have them there. Um, and if they rule in your favor, the smart contract finishes, and then uh, it's basically like having an extra signature uh, that you both parties agree at the beginning who is going to be the one that's going to be mediating if something goes wrong. So that is the approach. And again, we're looking very much. We met already with with Claros and with with people from the Aragon Court. We, we're all about integ integrating. We found them to be focused in other industries, not so much in B2B. But hopefully, uh, by the time we're done, um, we'll have something to announce uh, in a very a more sound interaction with those teams. Great. Yeah. Well, that, that that was also an interesting uh, question. I think uh, we have people who know the industry in the audience, and that's great. Um, I, so before we go, because we're going to close this soon, um, I I would like to to hear about your next uh, major milestones and the the kind of objectives that you have now. I mean, obviously you're growing this uh, this business and you're growing Dex Freight uh, as a whole. But can you tell us? more about what the, the, the future holds for Dex Freight. Yes, so we wanted to do a big launch of the platform by COVID arrived. And we kind of modify a little bit our go-to-market sure. strategy because all of a sudden the DeFi solution is way more important for carriers than it used to be. They need cash and they need it now. Making sure they get paid faster is important. Simultaneously in the maker ecosystem, uh, the attention to the type of collateral that we bring to the table is way more important. So one of the milestones that we plan to achieve is to get approved as a as a collateral for the MCD, so we can start using that and bring that usability to the carriers, and that's happened this year. We also have um, are about to launch. We have an MVP already um, uh, on the data marketplace with Ocean Protocol. Uh, so within the next within uh, the rest of this year. Uh, we're going to launch that so customers in the platform can start monetizing the data. Uh, there's a lot of appetite for that. We've been advancing on that. And the launch, even though it's not publicized as a main launch, we're just adding the next, th this TMS that I mentioned there, uh, we added 550 new companies to the equation. And this is $800 million worth of freight that we need to move. So very busy um, augmenting the size of the team so we can onboard all of these customers and give them the service they, they deserve. Great. Well, I, I wish you all the best and uh, 
I look forward to hearing more from you and how you can use uh, RSK technology in, in your future plans for, for the benefit of all your clients, users, and trucking companies out there. Thank you very much, Hector. It was really a fascinating topic. Thank you very much to everyone for following this webinar. And please um, watch out for further RSK use cases, webinars, and general RSK use cases coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day in Asia and good night in the US. Mm -hmm. Thank you.